All right, Ed, welcome back to the Hit It podcast. Super, 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 super excited here today as we have Keith St. Ange on the podcast. Welcome, Keith. Hey, thanks for having me. Looking forward to having a good discussion about uh, some of the history in the past and, and the, the wonderful things that water skiing has brought to me. Well, yeah, and looking at what we're going to cover today, I think the audience is going to be just so stoked to hear what you have to say on so many different topics. I mean, this this conversation is taking place towards the latter part of your career, but still here in 2022, it's been a monstrous year. I mean, you learn that you're going to be an inductee to the Water Ski Hall of Fame in 2023, and just a couple weeks ago, for the fifth consecutive time, you were helping bring home the gold medal uh, in the World Water Ski Show Ski Tournament. I mean, it things still feel like they're moving for you. <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, I've been fortunate, you know, it's been fun. Uh, yeah, I'll be 45 here in a few months and was able to be on the uh, U.S. show ski team and uh, yeah, brought the, the gold home there. Um, yeah, it seems like, you know, I don't ever want the career to stop, but uh, but the body is telling me, whoa, <laughs> hold on, boy, <laughs> you can't go on anymore. So, uh, so I, I think that might be my last big one, but uh, it, it's been fun to, to have it kind of continue as long as it has. Yeah, excellent. Well, I want to just go back to the early days. You know, we're going to recap your Hall of Fame career here and, and the majority of the podcast. And I, I I came across your book, and I'm going to mention it a bunch of times on audible.com. And that book is called Gliding Souls. And we'll, we'll touch on that uh, many times throughout this podcast. But in that book, you start basically at the beginning of your career of how you got introduced to barefooting and it leads all the way through. Take us back to your beginnings. And I believe, you know, you're in Florida now, but back then you were back East and the water was cold uh, and you were barefooting. Uh, walk us through the progression of how you got introduced to barefooting. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's kind of the cool thing, too, is uh, being inducted to the Hall of Fame. You start thinking about the things you want to say and, and what you want people to know in your speech. And um, and it does it just it starts right here in the very beginning on where I'm from. You know, a lot of skiers come from northern Wisconsin and things like that. But I'm from northern New Hampshire. Uh, very similar weather uh, cl climates. But uh, the big thing that's, that's different where I'm from is that we have mountains up there in northern New Hampshire. The uh, world's fastest wind recorded speed was from Mount Washington for, I think that held for like 40 or 50 years at 231 miles an hour. So it just goes to show how how cold and how few months you can actually ski up there as a skier. So um, my grandfather and his two brothers built a small cabin on a lake uh, about 45 minutes north of where we were from, which is Berlin, New Hampshire. And we'd go up there on the weekends, uh, two or three families in one cottage, slept 21 people comfortably, bunk beds everywhere. And we would just ski and have fun on the lake uh, as a family and, and of course, swim with cousins and relatives. And it was, it was a blast. And um, uh, my cousin, which was, uh, is so my grandfather's brother, his son, my second cousin, Gary Bouchard, otherwise known as Swampy, had a little ski club that he started up there. And when I say ski club, it's not like a show ski team especially like what I just skied. And it was literally maybe a, a guy on a slalom ski ripping through with 50 people watching on the shoreline, maybe a hundred people watching on the shoreline, one show a year, just, you know, just kind of fun and, and small, but we just did what we could do. And, uh, and Swampy decided to hire world champion at the time, Mike Seipel from Wisconsin. Uh, and he was doing a clinic all week. And the last day, all the guys were so sore and tired that he said, hey, is there any young kids that want to try it? So myself and my two cousins went out there and um, we were all, you know, I had, I think I had slalom skied that summer for the first time. So I kicked off the ski in the boom and my two cousins kicked off the ski in the boom. And one was a trick skier, one was a slalom skier, and I just happened to become the barefooter. Um, and these, these guys that barefooted hardcore back in the day, they just took me out with them all the time. They gave me the option, hey, you want to come out, you want to come out, you want to come out? You know, I was only uh, nine years old at the time. Um, so, yeah, my, my my father would come out once in a while with us. But most times my mom and dad would just say, go ahead, take them and let them, let them go ski with you guys. And that's what I did. I just skied with these guys, other guys that barefooted. And I literally stuck with barefooting from that point on. Really, really never even touched skis after that. Well, that's so cool, too, because later on your path 
cross again with Mike Seipel, but in the competitive world of barefooting rather than, you know, kind of the teacher, the student role. And we'll touch base on that. Um, one thing I really enjoyed about your book, and we look at the, you know, the, the breadth of literature and biographies. Um, I mentioned to you this offline that the, the really the first biography that, you know, we were introduced into the world was St. Augustine's Confessions. And the thing about that book, what makes it so powerful is it almost bears your soul. And when you bear your soul, you learn so much about what it takes not only to be a regional champion, a national champion, but in your case, a world champion and in the Hall of Fame and inductee. And for the first time, I believe you have created a roadmap of things that people can anticipate if they so choose to go on that journey. And there are parts in this book that are just so unbelievable because it's not only about barefooting, but it's about your life. It's about what you learn. It's the application on and off the water. And there's a conversation in this book that you get around the age of maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I, I think it's a, a conversation between you, Swampy, and your parents. Uh, obviously, this huge support team that you had around us where you're, or around you where you're saying, okay, like the next step is going to be very critical if I'm going to become a competitive athlete. And there looked like there was some chewing and wrestling that went on, but the level of dedication, it looked like to take it to the next level, everybody was very aware of not only your talent, but hey, Keith, this is going to be a big commitment. Do you want to do this? Seems like a pivotal place in that book. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you, you bringing up the book because um, everybody that's read it or listened to it, people that said they've never read a book in their life have finished this book because they, they got so into it. And you're right. It's not about barefoot water skiing. It doesn't really talk about you know, technique in barefoot water skiing. It's just my life on the water, what I learned from barefoot water skiing and what hopefully some young kids and even older people can can take away with them and, and help them in everyday uh, life or whatever the, their passion is. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, going going through all those, those years of, of barefooting and up until I was 13 years old, it was, and this is what I reminded people of just this last week when we we're doing the World Show Ski Worlds is, um, Make sure you do it because it's fun, right? We get involved in water skiing because it's fun. Sometimes when we start training and taking it to the next level, you kind of lose that, that fun side of things. And you always have to remind yourself of that. So that's what happened when I was 13 years old. A newspaper reporter asked me first, he said, what do you want to do with your, with your barefooting career? Where, where do you see yourself going? And I said, I'd like to be a uh, move to Florida, have a ski school, win the nationals and become world champion. Um, and then the next conversation after that was with my parents and Swampy. And they said, here's the deal, Keith. You can barefoot. You can ski. We can go up to the, the lake every weekend just like we're doing and have fun. And it can be relaxed. Um, but we're probably not going to go to nationals or maybe even regionals or go to all these tournaments. Um, or the other option is you can uh, take, take your skiing to the next step and train hard and really work hard at it and we will support you because obviously you know it's a lot of time and gas in the boat and all that stuff boat payments and uh and if that's what you want to do and you want to travel and go to regionals and go to nationals and do all the tournaments and and take it to the next step then you have to commit to yourself and to us that that's what you want to do and if that's what you want to do we will support you but just let us tell you and let it be known that we will push you and give you a kick in the butt when you need it, because this is not a joke. If we're going to take it serious, we're going to take it serious. If you want to just have fun with it, we'll just have fun with it. Um, and no, my, my response was I was so passionate and so into it. I said, no, let's go all the way. I want to travel. I want to go to regionals. I want to go to nationals. I want to ski three times a day. I'll let Swampy push me. I mean, I look back at some of the VHS videos and one set was over an hour. And I'm not saying... You know, it was, I was with the dry suit on and choppy water. It was windy. It might've been raining and we were skiing for an hour straight and we were training hard. Um, but you know what? It was fun. That's what we enjoyed doing. We, we had a passion and we had a goal and, you know, we just took it uh, three months at a time <laughs> year by year. Yeah. Well, no. And that's the incredible like turning point 
it seems like in your career, you just decided, Hey, I'm going to take it to the next level. You had your support system behind you. And then you were rocking and rolling and moving up the ranks very, very quickly at that point. One of the things when I look at your career, uh, especially towards the latter part of the 90s, you're really bursting onto the scenes. And the exposure that barefooting got during that time with the X Games was just incredible. Uh, there was We were losing some traction as in water skiing as a whole on ESPN. But for barefooting to get barefoot jumping going in the X Games brought a whole new platform and you were there for that. Tell us a little bit about that experience. No, that was like, <clears throat> that was like part of the dream, right? All those years of training and practicing. And now all of a sudden you have an opportunity to ski in the, in the X Games on ESPN. I mean, that's like huge, huge cash prize. Um, that, that was it, man. That's when I got to that point. I just said, all of this has been worth it. Uh, so, and not only that, but right before and right after the X games, we were having X games format is what we would call it. And that was at right after the nationals. So we'd have the U S nationals X games format. And then we, and that was on ESPN. And then we started doing the U S open, which was also on ESPN. So yeah, those from like 97 to 2000, those three, four years there, it was just, yeah, the sport had exploded. We were getting the exposure, there were a ton of skiers, lots of sponsors. Um, yeah, that those those were the times where it was just so so fun, and it was all just so worth it. Yeah, no, and, and barefoot jumping. I mean, just from even being in the three event world was something that I never got to see or really experience. So to find a platform like ESPN to push that out uh, to the general public, it's incredible. It's very extreme uh, what you guys were doing. So. It, it, it brought a lot of people to the sport. You're emerging during this time um, as one of the top athletes and up and comers. Uh, so now you're facing the legends of like Ron Scarpa and Mike Seipel. Um, What was it like to get to that point? And what was it like to think, you know, maybe I can be better than these guys? Uh, well, the funny story about Mike Seipel, I think the first and only time I actually competed against him was in the U.S. Open down in Okahili. Um, And let's see, I think it was like 93 and 94. And we were it was a head to head format at the time. So he and I were head to head. I did my run first. Uh, he was seated above me. He did his run. He had actually beat me, but he decided on the last run that he wanted to take a re-ride to try to improve his score so he could have that score help him in his overall um, so he took the rear ride on a second pass and the handle popped off his foot on a toe up start and he lost his whole run. So I actually beat him because he took that rear ride and missed his toe up. And that to me was just like, the like, wow, this is the guy that taught me. This is the guy I've been like looking up to. And I actually beat him. I mean, of course he could have beat me probably very easily, but still, I, I did some big tricks in that tournament. I did uh, like line turns and feet to feet toe turns that really not too, too many people were seeing yet. Um, so it was cool. I was like, oh man, maybe I can do this after all. And then further on in 1997, it was when I competed against Ron Scarpa and the cool story. I love this story because I never won a gold medal medal at a nationals my whole entire career. Either I had maybe not skied as good, or there were people that were just better than me in the junior boys, boys and, and men's one division. Um, but anyway, when I beat Ron, uh, for the overall and I won slalom and I won tricks in 1997, that was not only the first, uh, gold medal that I won at a national, but it was the first overall gold medal that I won at a national. And it was beating Ron Scarpa, which of course was a huge idol of mine. And, uh, somebody I looked up to and, and, you know, looked at all his videos for years and stuff like that. So when I beat Ron there in 97, which I had just graduated high school, I was just like, oh man, if I can do this now, it's. It's on, man. I, I'm so motivated and so pumped to to really make this my full on career. And uh, and right after that is when I moved to Florida. Yeah, no, I want to touch base on that Ron Scarpa uh, battle there. And and one thing that's mentioned in the book that and again, I'm going to keep endorsing this book. Keith. It's an amazing, amazing Thank piece you. of work. Um, there's 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 things that you were learning on how to become a professional barefooter outside of being on the water. You know, you were dealing with sponsors, you were dealing with finances. How do we make this thing work? You know, do I coach? Do I open up a ski school? I mean, what, what do I do? 
And there's a story detailed in this book where you had a handle, I believe, that was given to you by Ron Scarpa. It was a Ron Scarpa handle, and you were competing. And uh, for whatever the reason was, you had scraped his name off the handle, and he noticed that at the tournament. Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, you know, that's being uh, young and dumb on my side. So, yeah, Ron sponsored me with the handle. So I was looking for sponsorships back then, and I, I had known Ron a little bit and skied with him a little bit. So I asked if he would uh, sponsor me with a handle, and he did. He gave me a free Ron Scarpa handle, and I skied with it all summer. <clears throat> and I think that, w- that was that 1997. I'm pretty sure it was because I had him so much in my sights, and I, and I knew I was so close to beating him that – Every time I did a, a trick run or I started and I had the handle and it said Ron Scarpa on it, I was like, I don't want to see this name. I mean, he's pissing me off. I, I got to. So anyway, I, yeah, I scraped that off of the handle and kind of made it my own handle. Um, and when we got to the nationals and we were skiing, he noticed that um, and he approached me about it and he brought it to my attention that, you know, Hey man, I sponsored you. <laughs> he just ripped my name off this handle. Um, that's not cool. And if it's going to be like this, you know, I will, I will, you know, do whatever I have to do to, to make it right and make you learn the right way, you little stinker type deal. I mean, uh, he said some other things that we won't say here, but he was right. And that's what I try to portray in the book is uh, he was right. I did the wrong thing. It wasn't, it wasn't right of me to do that. Not was he only a sponsor of mine, but uh, he was an idol and someone I looked up to. And, and the reason I got to where I did was, was a lot to do with him. So for the motivation part of things. So yeah, he was right. So, uh, you know, when you're young, you don't think about these little things. Uh, when you, when you get approached face to face by, uh, by your, by your idol like that, and they, 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 they tell you straight up, you better change your way or, or else. Yeah. So I, yeah, I admit to a lot of mistakes I've made in the book and what I learned from those things. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was one of very few stories that are in the book that, um, that, that you'll get a, a kick out of. Well, and I think that's what makes the book so special. The fact that you have the ability to reflect on that and to bring that story to light to say, hey, look, you know, for all you youngsters out there, you need to be thinking about these types of things. I mean, that's that's the value that that book holds. Um, what One of the things going back to your commitment to becoming who you were in the sport was, um, the, the path to success or the path to the top of the podium is not always a straight path. And especially in a sport where you're financially trying to gather as many resources as you possibly can to make it, there were times a- along your career, it was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to have rent to, to, to pay next month to keep on going. Maybe I should bail out now and do what my friends are doing back home and have a more secure job. What do you think kept you committed to your dream instead of giving off, giving up and saying, Hey, I'm going to take the safe route. Yeah, I think it was just all the time and effort I had put into it. And, and just always having that goal of trying to succeed in, in what I, what I love doing, which was skiing and being in the boat and instructing and teaching. And I just, I just love that. Yeah. So I literally moved to Florida with a thousand dollars in my pocket. I had a good friend, uh, his name was Dusty Vines. He lent me his old S10 pickup truck. And then I had another friend, uh, Mike Sauber. Um, he got me a part-time job working at night, uh, setting up ice sculptures and um and there were some tough times i remember i had a conversation with my mom one night just saying i don't know if i can do this it's just uh having a hard time paying my rent i got a truck that breaks down when it's 100 degrees out and i'm at a red light the thing just shuts off won't start again for like two five minutes people are honking at me and um yeah trying to find a boat sponsor i mean there was a lot of things there that i probably should have moved back home because it's probably the only, it's like the natural thing to do, right? If you're not making it and what you're, and what you, what you put yourself out to and you can't do it, then you just, you, you, you fall back onto family, friends or where you're comfortable at. And my mom said, she was, of course, you know, moms are, are, are moms. They, they, they're awesome. She said, if you need to come home or here for you, whatever. And she kind of even motivated me and just said, you know, you're there now, try to, try to figure it out and, and make, make the best of it. Just, just know that you, you can come home if you need to, but really give it your all before you give up. Cause you might, you might regret it. And so that was it. And it was just like, okay, Hey, if I was actually renting a house on a lake in Claremont. I had just, uh, was working on a boat sponsor 
Um, so it was close to happening. So I knew if I got that boat, I could get some skiers then I could start having a little bit of income. And my buddy Dusty Vines that lent that truck to me, he was paying half of my rent for me. He wasn't even living there. He was just paying half my rent. He said he was going to move in and do all that, but he never did. Later now, I know he was just helping me out. So, you know, you just got to, you just got to, I wasn't quite at rock bottom. I was close. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's key, man. You got to, whatever you're doing and whatever you're into, don't give up until you hit that rock bottom. Um, and that, that's what I did. Everything, things just slowly started to turn around. I had my skiing, right? And that's what Swampy always told me. <clears throat> he said, don't worry about anything else. Let your skiing do the talking. If you ski well and you're training hard and your skiing's doing the talking and you're winning, things will turn, things will help. You will become busier at the ski school. Your career will take off. And yeah, that's what I did, man. I just I just did what I knew how to do and what I always loved to do. I just kept on skiing. I kept on winning nationals. And then I finally got this boat sponsor and I finally got the skiers. And, uh, and literally I was in the boat from morning until night. I didn't want to get out of the boat. I was having so much fun. Yeah, and just an amazing start, uh, story and a journey. And you've mentioned him a couple of times on this podcast, Swampy. Swampy plays a pivotal role throughout your entire life. Um, and and anybody that reads this book will see that. That, uh, I mean, not only was he there for you, you were there for him. Tell us about that relationship because, you know, it's so important to have that support on the water when it comes to training and technique and everything that it takes to become a champion. But you guys were also there for each other off the water. Yeah, he was like, um, I mean, he was kind of like a second father to me. You know, he took me under his wing and we did lots of trips up to the, the cottage uh, in his truck, driving up 45 minutes, skiing for an hour, driving back to go to school and he go to work the next day. So it was a lot of time spent there with one another. Um, and yeah, he just, he's just a natural motivator. He knows how to motivate you. He knows how to get under your skin when you need it. He knows to give you a, a kick in the butt. He knows how to compliment you when you're down and bring you back up. Uh, he's really good like that. Very natural. Um, and he, he gave me his everything. Um, he, he's, you know, he split everything with my parents, the payment of the boat and the, the gas payments and, you know, equipment that I needed. He'd buy me equipment for like Christmas and things like that. So yeah, he was definitely the backbone um, for, for the from the beginning. And then uh, then he moved away uh, about 90, 90, I think it was 97, 98. He moved out, out west and I moved to Florida. So we had 10 years apart of me kind of doing my own thing, trying to find myself. Um, we kept in touch off and on. And uh, I was able to win a world championship on my own. And the two world championships, the overall titles that I won, are kind of the most important ever because the first one I won on my own. And for 10 years, I trained myself. I figured out how to do things on my own, trained myself. I won the world champions. I actually did in every round of tricks, three rounds of tricks, I set a new world record in every single round, which is really cool. And then he ended up moving down to Florida, two reasons. One, I need some help at the ski school. I was getting so busy that I needed, I needed help. And two, uh, he kind of went a different direction in his life and things kind of fell apart with what he was doing. So as he rolled by to, to catch up with me, you know, next thing you know, he's still in Florida. He's still the, coaching the top skiers in the world and creating top skiers right now. And he and I got together again. He started training me again and we went to the 09 Worlds in New Zealand and we won the world title together. So that was like so awesome. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like I said, he's still at the ski school now managing it coaching some of these young kids, uh, coach David Small, world champion, and coach Ben Grohn for years, Ashley Stebbings, world champion. So he now has just uh, so many awesome skiers underneath him that he's that he's trained, AJ Pareka. I mean, the names go on and on and on, but um, but yeah, he he's very instrumental in the sport of barefoot water skiing. Yeah, no, very, very cool. One of the things I really enjoyed learning about was one day you and Swampy, I believe, are out on the lake. And I never really thought about this from a three event perspective. We don't deal with it as much as you do as from a barefooting perspective. And you guys are looking for dead fish, right? Because that could be detrimental when you're go blistering across the water and you hit a fish. Um, Swampy goes down, he takes it. Okay, I think it's okay. You end up going down the lake, boom, you hit something. It ends up being a spine of a fish going directly into your heel. I cannot even imagine or fathom the pain that caused. Tell us about that day and tell us about that story on how it was removed. 
Yeah, that was pretty wild. We had a major cold front come through and it got so cold that all the fish died and floated up. And this was not, um, I'm not sure exactly how many months it was before the training for the worlds, but a couple of months or maybe three or four months. But anyway, all the fish um, were just everywhere in the in the lake, but the wind was blowing and it blew most of them to the other side of the lake. So where it was calm, we started skiing and it didn't look like there's any fish around. So, and we had to ski, right? I mean, it's like, hey, we're training for this world's here coming up. We got to get on it. So anyway, yeah, I was skiing and I hit this, that something that felt like a heavy, wet sponge on my foot. It didn't really hurt that much, um, but I let go. And when I was floating in the water, I pulled my heel up and looked at it and there was like blood coming out of the heel. And I was like, wow, what's that? And I went to touch it to see why my heel was bleeding. And I like must've hit that spine. And I just touched that spine and just instant pain. I got in the boat, showed Swampy, I hit a fish, something stuck in there. I really, really didn't know that it was a major spine at the time. It was just like a cut or something that was lodged in there. So he put me on his shoulders and uh, carried me to the car, stuck in the car. I went to the hospital, laying there in the hospital, and they took the x-ray, and you could see my heel, and then you could see the 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 spine and the point of it almost touching the bone of my heel, um and i remember when they showed me the x-ray and i was like oh man i hope this doesn't like mess my career up or like mess my foot up or so i gotta get affected or leave a hole or who knows what right so this lady she you know gave me a shot uh to to, to numb everything in my heel and she had these literally like needle nose pliers on the end and she was going in a circle to make the hole bigger so i was like what are you doing like be careful <laughs> out there like, these are my feet i need these things she was like, I'm making the hole bigger. So when I pull it out, it comes out all in one piece. <clears throat> so she thought she was being funny. And she said, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, this, you know, I, I told her I prepared for water ski. And she goes, oh, yeah, this could be a career ender. And I got like mad. I was like, what are you talking about, lady? Don't, you, don't tell me that right now. This is what I do for my living. You know, this is my dream. Don't be telling me that stuff. Anyway, boom, she pulled it out. And she pulled out the whole spine. Um and it was pretty, pretty wild that she pulled up the whole thing. So anyway, she pulled it all out. We started the healing process. I started walking on it, putting pressure on it. And I was like, what is that? Something is still in my heel. Something just does not feel right. So I got my heel up and I started looking and started kind of digging in it. Cause something, I could feel like there was something hard in there. And I had like a little needle. And as I was going in there, I like felt something. And uh, when I opened up this, like, it was like a little cavity of a hard spot and I opened it up, there was a little piece of uh, fish scale in there. So everything had come up with that fish scale and I ended up pulling that thing out. And from that point on, it has healed perfectly fine and never had any issues with it. Wow. It's such an interesting and unique story and I never would have thought of it, but my goodness, it's a, it's like a, a surgeon's hands. You can't mess with the surgeon's hands. You can't mess with a barefooter's feet. Right. There's no jokes there. Yeah. Um, you know, unprecedented what you've been able to do in this sport 14 world championship gold medals two-time overall champion at the worlds uh it the sport has brought you to many places around the world you've met some incredible people one of those incredible people is dave ramsey and i just wanted to hear about your relationship with dave it's really really cool that someone that has that big of a platform is into barefoot water skiing tell us a little bit about dave yeah, uh, he he contacted me. I think it was, I don't know if it was a call or an email, but somebody reached out to me um, for Dave Ramsey and really kind of knew the name, but didn't know him, didn't know him well. This was probably back in 04, maybe. Yeah, 04, 06, right, right, right before one of the world uh, games that we had. And uh, I actually, actually had to Google him to kind of figure out exactly who this guy really was. So yeah, I Googled him and said, oh, wow, this guy, is, he's a pretty big shot here. <laughs> I better give them a call back and see what's going on. So I think he got my name from Mastercraft because Mastercraft had sponsored me for about eight years. Uh, and he was a big Mastercraft owner and loves Mastercraft boats. So I called him and uh, he goes, yeah, I want to hire you for a barefoot water ski clinic. Um, I'll send you all the details, blah, 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 blah. And that was it. So I literally flew in, uh, had a car there waiting for me, a rental car, jumped in, drove down to his place in South Tennessee on the lake. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was cool, you know, very, very humble man. 
uh, lived the way he spoke from what I read online, you know, um, had a lake house, had an old secondhand pickup truck in the driveway, had his Iron Man watch on that he always talks about. You know, you don't need anything spectacular to, uh, to read time on. Don't waste your money. Um, and yeah, it was cool. His son was there. He had a couple good friends there. They all could already barefoot, but they wanted to learn more. They wanted to learn how to do tumble turns and backwards and, and, and anything like that. So we had a great week, just really good conversations. Um, we all got along great. And uh, that was, yeah, that was a week long clinic. So next, next year he hired me again. And, uh, and it was even better. We even grew closer. Um, he even endorsed my book, um, read parts of the book. Um, was very instrumental in some of the things that I've done and changed in my life. So, uh, yeah, the relationship we have is great. We still keep in touch. Uh, we still always get Christmas cards from each other, from our families. So yeah, he was, he was a great guy to be around and, uh, he, he shared. And in my book, I say it, some of the books that he, uh, re recommends reading. I read some of those books and, uh, wow. Yeah. They can be life-changing for sure. The, the one that I like the most, it just always sticks out in my head is, uh, thou shall prosper by um by rabbi um lapin i think it was yeah thou shalt prosper that's a really good book to read um and then of course the other one is the shack i had a pretty big issue with somebody kind of uh doing some nasty things to me behind my back um and anyway he told me read this book um the shack and that really helped me in uh learning about forgiveness um and how to forgive others that that may not do the right things to you so yeah it was pretty pretty cool stuff yeah, and, and those are detailed in the book. And again, that's why that book is so important because it gives you the life lessons that make you not only successful on the water with everything that you need, but off of the water. Because as you went through your journey up to the point you are right now, the ability to interact with people, uh, the ability to balance the interaction with sponsors, with the competitive nature that it takes to be a world champion, all of those things come into play and you kind of have to know when to turn one switch off and turn the other one on. Um, tell us a little bit about your interaction with sponsors throughout the year. You know, industry plays such a pivotal role in supporting athletes, uh, but it, it, it can be an interesting role too, because um, you're out there trying to win and um, obviously they want to sell product. And sometimes Along the way, there might be some disagreements. Um, that just seems like an interesting thing to balance off of the water to keep your career going. Yeah, um, yeah, sponsors can be very important in, in many different ways. <clears throat> um, like for me, and barefooting is a little bit smaller than like three events and stuff like that, and like wakeboarding. <clears throat> so the sponsorships more so came through personal relationships. You know, people that you've trained or taught. Uh, you get along good with them. They want to sponsor. They want to help you out. So like one was a boat sponsor. Um, so I had Richard Grant, uh, still a good friend of mine today. He would buy a boat. I would use it. And then we'd sell it at the end of the year. Um, and of course, you know, it was his boat. He made the profits, but I got a free boat out of the deal. You know, how can you beat that? How can you beat something like that? <clears throat> um, as time went on, I had some great handles and rope sponsors. Uh, today, you know, Masterline uh, supports me. Eagle Wetsuits, I just made this comment the other day. Um, Eagle Wetsuits, they sent me my first uh, Eagle Wetsuit when I was 16 years old. Uh, my least favorite color is purple. And when the suit showed up, I couldn't wait to open the box up and I rip it open. And it's a purple wetsuit. Of course, they didn't ask me what color wetsuit I wanted. I wasn't going to ask and tell them what color wetsuit I wanted. So I get this nasty ugly purple wetsuit but guess what oh man i wore that thing with pride my first free wetsuit from eagle it was awesome uh, and i'm still with them today uh so that's been a long relationship so it's all about relationships um there's been some tough tough times too in the book i kind of go into that I had, I had a sponsor um that was i don't like to talk about people and that's something I've, I've learned over the years is i don't like gossip and i don't like talking about people especially talking bad about people but um, this one sponsor uh, taught me some things um, on really how not to be and how not to treat people and how lying always comes around and and uh, and catches you. Um, so, you know, it's better off just to tell the truth uh, no matter what, because you can always remember the truth. You can't always remember your lies that you told. Right. That's why this, the stories always change when somebody lies. So, uh, yeah, I learned some, you know, you, you don't just learn um, positive things from people. <clears throat> you can see the negative side from people and learn those those things and not how to act as well these are 
how to act in some some things, and this is how not to act in, in other ways. So yeah, uh, you're gonna find out if you're in the public eye that it's not worth talking um, smack about somebody, not worth gossiping about somebody. You always appreciate the sponsors that you have had because during those sponsorships, even though one of them ended pretty abruptly for me in a, a very rough way, there was a lot of good things that came out of that sponsorship too. You know, things that that taught me things um, that you know paid me well. So, yeah, I was able to buy my first house because of that sponsorship. So yeah, sponsorships are tough in a small industry, but they are very important. They are very pivotal, and um, anybody that 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 makes a living in the water sport world hats off to them it's 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 you're not you're not dealing with millions of people unfortunately you're dealing with thousands so um so so it, you know it's the, what it comes down to is do what you love if, if you love what you do whether it's barefooting water skiing wakeboarding or whatever it may be you just do it because you love it and that's that's what it's all about awesome one one thing that i wanted to ask you because i always think it's an interesting question especially to someone so well-traveled um, barefooting in so many places is where is your, when you look back and you reflect, what is the most uh, favorite memory of barefooting? I mean, was it in a tournament? Was it in practice? Was it just hanging out? I mean, when you reflect, where, where, where was that place and where was that time? It's such a hard question always because uh, there's so many good times and fun places and good people that you meet along the way. Um, I think some of my best times were, were in uh, Australia. I love Australia. I love the people. I love the country. Um, I love the humor. Um, yeah, I had a lot of good times. I used to go down to Australia for like a month, month and a half and stay with friends and travel and do clinics all around the country. I had some really good times down there. Um, I mean, I used to have some, I used to do some training down in, um, uh, Slidell, uh, Louisiana on the Pearl River, which is the, by far the best place I've ever been to water skied. It's like 13 miles of a old dugout um, bargeway that is that they're not using anymore with 80 foot trees on each side, too narrow to wake where long skin you can only barefoot on it. And it turns like, you know, 10 degrees and goes two miles this way and another 10 degrees and goes, it's always a glass. I used to love going down there. I love I love the people and the culture and the area. Um, we were kind of back in the bayou, kind of doing our own training for national. I did that for like five or six years with Richard Grant. Uh, that was really cool. And there's so many things that come up that that were just amazing. We had the World Games in uh, Kita, Japan. Well, that was a fun trip. Um, you know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. There's just so many good people I've met, so many great friendships. And I mean, I love traveling. I just love love seeing the culture and the food and how people live it's it's really cool it's actually now that i have three little kids the wife and i we don't travel abroad too much but we are like itching to go somewhere <laughs> yeah no doubt no doubt well, this, traveling you know absolutely well this is somewhat of an unfair question too because i'm asking a three eventer um what their favorite event is i mean I, 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 you look at what you've been able to do. I mean, first person in tricks over 10,000 points. You, you held the slalom world record uh, 20.6. When you look at your jump career, it looked like there was times within your career to get the championship. You had to do things that you never thought you could do. And so it seemed like that was one of those things that unexpectedly at times pulled through to be a huge event for you. So. When you look back on it, um, of the three events, uh, I mean, tell us maybe your strengths and your weaknesses, but, you know, which one was the most fun for you to compete in overall? Well, the first thing I think of when you ask that question is what Swampy used to always say is you're only as strong as your weakest link. <laughs> and my weakest link was jumping. Um, I was always, I love, I love flying through the air. I grew up snow skiing, so I was always jumping. I could fly through the air well, but when I learned jumping, it was still the beginning of the learning the inverted style of jumping when you let your feet go behind you so everybody's kind of doing their own thing so I was able to learn that fairly easily but as time went on I wasn't able to really perfect uh the style as much as I wanted to mostly due because I saw someone um hit the ramp and and have a pretty bad injury right in front of me and he, he ended up passing away that really messed my mind up for a long time so I kind of stayed away from jumping and never really put my energy towards it um, so I'll get back to that one in a second, but I would say 
I'd say slalom is my second favorite. It's the most natural to me. It always became very, just not not easy, but easier to me than most, I would say. Um, and then tricks, I think tricks is probably my most enjoyable, just because I love the challenge of stringing tricks together and trying to make your runs as seamless and clean as possible and adding up all those tricks. And when it, when you put two big trick runs together, you know, you're 15 seconds and you're putting like, 20 tricks in a 15 second period and you're you're doing multiple turns you're doing toe turns but basic and reverse you're doing one foot turns you're doing line turns multiple line turns you're doing all this flown from one to the next um so tricks was pretty pretty fun i like that uh and then back to jumping and jumping when i finally decided to strip all my bad habits out and start all over again directly on the boom then on the five foot extension, and then on the 10 foot extension, 15 foot extension, and then long line, spent a whole year redefining how I jumped and breaking all of my own bad habits, which was just a long, brutal process. But in the end, when I could do a big jump and jump over 80 feet and land it smooth and clean, that's a pretty tough feeling to be when you're flying through the air like Superman. 15 feet up there and you're flying, you know, I, I think my furthest was about 86 feet. Wow. You're going 86 feet and you land it smoothly. I mean, it's, there's nothing. That's a pretty cool feeling. It's that's fun. That's that extreme right there. But yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about jump too, because when you go into that extended style, Superman style of, of jumping, the, I mean, your approach to the ramp looks very much the same. It, it appears. Is it is it basically how much kick you can get off the ramp? What makes you go from I don't know a seventy foot jump to an eighty foot jump? Um, oh, seventy foot to an eighty foot. I mean, it's just simply uh, position and timing. So the problem with jumping is that your your the max speed you can go is forty five miles an hour. The jump is six feet long. So you're going that fast on a small jump. It's really, it's hard to time it. Your timing is so, so crucial. Um, the next hard thing to do is since in your mind, you're going to be letting your shoulders go forward and your feet go behind you. What everybody does in the beginning is that they kind of lunge at the jump. They kind of raise and fall forward. So their feet get kicked up behind them. But in actuality, after, you know, training with David Small for years and he's the world record holder, nobody can you know, has jumped ever uh, bigger or smoother than him is he kept on telling me, which I had such a hard time doing um, was raised super slow. So your timing will always be on. And he always used to say he used to raise back. So he would like literally try to do a back flip off of the jump. As he rode up the jump, he tried to push his shoulders back and raise the handle, which that's like against all natural uh, thinking processes of, of trying to jump inverted. So, yeah. So as I started trying to think about that, which I can never mimic quite as, as perfect as him, that's for sure. But when I did have a slow raise and I, my shoulders stayed back and I lifted the handle up as I was on the ramp, which is tough to time. But when you do that, it, it leads to the 80 plus foot jump. It leads to a great smooth flight through the air and it actually naturally makes you land smoothly like you can land on top of your feet if you don't hit your feet first you're not skiing and jump away you need to hit your feet first it takes about 70 percent of the impact off and then you kind of slide down to your butt and then stand back up so uh yeah when you do it all right and smooth it is just like it's just the flight is is awesome it's so cool no, it, it looks cool. It's And that's why it goes back to that X Games. I mean, that was like the first time I think everybody was super exposed to the sport of because of, you know, ESPN. And uh, I look at that it, and you've spent a lot of years in the boat coaching. Um, barefooting takes an extreme amount of commitment, uh, but it looks to me like it takes an extreme amount of toughness and endurance through years to get, to get that skill. When you're evaluating someone that looks like they're going to be coming up through the ranks. What kind of role does endurance and toughness play to the overall trajectory of their career possibly as becoming the best barefooter as possible? Well, I mean, I hate to say it, but these days it doesn't seem like some of the kids are as tough as they used to be. Um, Because back in the day, maybe it was just the only way we knew, right? 
but but people can really take some hard falls um, and get up and just go again and take another hard fall. And, and, and unfortunately in barefoot water skiing, when you're going that fast and you catch that quickly and abruptly, the falls are can be brutal and they are brutal and they they really play a mind game on people. So when people fall for the first time, you know, two things happen. They either say, they shake it off and say, I won't do it again, or I will improve, or that feeling of barefoot was so fun. I, I don't care if I take a fall. Or the other one is, this just isn't for me. Like, I don't want to feel that again. That wasn't fun. You know, I did the scorpion where my heels hit the back of my head and I got the eye enema. It's not for me. Um, and, you know, to get to the level, like, to where Dave and I were at, David Small and I, it takes a lot of falls, but most importantly, it takes a lot of mental strength to, to tell yourself, like you're just playing mind games with yourself the whole time, right? You, you can't be afraid of the fall. If you're afraid of the fall, you're not going to progress. Um, so it's a lot of mental uh, mind games and a lot of toughness. You got to take that fall and you got to just shrug it off and get up and do it again. And that's what it comes down to. Um, so, but, it, but also there's been many times where I said that kid is going to go all the way and they didn't. And then I said the opposite of that kid, he doesn't have what it takes. He's not going to go. And he actually made it all the way. So we've been uh, swamping. And I have been wrong many times um, because what it takes is not just the toughness, not just the talent, but it takes the heart, it takes the passion, it takes the determination. It takes all of those things to really get to the next level. So just because this kid's got the talent and the body made for it, maybe the flat feet, it's not necessarily a, that's the kid that's going to take it all away. Um, the other kid, uh, Ryan Boyd, actually a good friend of mine and a, and, a, and a team member on the barefoot teams, he was the one. He was short, had this big arch in his foot, which doesn't make it any easier. Wasn't the most talented, but the kid was tough. And he had so much passion that he got to be so good. He was doing, you know, line turns and toe turns and one foot turns and jumping inverted. He was doing things that... Uh, that most people couldn't do, especially the way he was built. He, he just shined. So it, it, it takes a combination of all those things. Very cool that you break that down that way. And I wanted to ask about those falls because uh, I am a very, very, very novice barefooter in, in back in the day. I don't know if I would jump out there right now, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the difference between those and traditional water ski falls, it just, when you go down, you just, don't even know what happened in, in water ski falls for the most part most of the time you can kind of anticipate something is about to happen and at least roll to your back to protect yourself or do those types of things but in barefooting it seems to me like especially i can't even imagine trying tricks where you don't really know where your body is going for the first time that you <laughs> spin around and pop up and go what just happened i know people always ask me like well what how can i get better at falling as <laughs> it fall more often <laughs> <laughs> and, it, well, and it, it, it's it's and it's funny but it's true because even if i if like i've i've had it on video and i've done it many times if i think i'm going to fall my my chin and my head go down naturally like if i if i if i think a fall is coming i naturally chin goes to my chest so i can roll out of it and I've done that a few times and not actually fallen. And it's like, oh yeah, wait, I, I, I you know, I, I get away with it. Um, but the more you fall, the more that becomes natural. And then those falls become a little easier. Um, the worst is when you fall backwards, there is no, there is no tucking and rolling. You are exposed. When you fall backwards, you are exposed. Your head is exposed. Your back is exposed. Everything's exposed. There is no getting out of those. And then when you start jumping inverted for the first time and you're going 60, 70 feet, and you're not square on that ramp and your feet slip out on you and you go upside down and you're flying 60 feet and then 45 miles an hour landing on your head. There's no easy way out of that. So, <laughs> oh yeah, it's tough. It, it, it's a tough sport. It's a tough sport, but that's, that's what I love about it. It's so unique. No doubt. You guys are definitely the heavy hitters, man, out there taking some falls, but doing some really, really cool stuff. I wanted to ask you about the World Water Ski, uh, water, uh, Show Ski Championships that just happened in Florida. Uh, that was your fifth consecutive time to compete. Uh, Y'all got the gold medal. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, but it sounded like that could be your last dance, so to speak but I wanted to hear. Yeah, from you. I would say, I would say, so. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. I mean, that show was supposed to happen two years prior, right before COVID happened. Um, 
<clears throat> so this is like four years later, which, oh man, when they said you still want to be in the team, I was like, yes and no. I'm like, two years at this age can be a long time. Um, but no, it was, it was pretty cool. The experience was awesome. It was new for me to be on. I've done some show skiing with some amateur teams. I've never been on the U.S. show ski team before. Um, so it, it was cool. But yeah, I think this will probably be my last one. The next one goes back to Australia. Um, and my wife, my wife said, well, maybe <laughs> if, if you're, good if you're reason on, to travel. Yeah, exactly. That's, it. That's what she's talking about. Maybe if you're on the team that we can all go as a family. Um, I was like, oh, I just, as much as I want to do it and the experience is so fun and skiing and being with all those amazing, amazingly like, talented skiers and watching them and coming together and putting that show together to, to, to make it so as, as, as awesome as it was. I don't think I don't I just don't have it in me. I had a little back injury right before this. I've always had kind of a back thing in my career. Um, and I had a back injury that kind of wasn't due to skiing, but skiing didn't help it. Um, and it, I just barely was able to ski that tournament. So see, when you start having those discussions with yourself, like, oh, man, I had a, an injury and I was just and I went through all this pain and I was just able to when you have those discussions with yourself, that that's your body saying you, you can't do this anymore. As much as you want to, as fun as it was, and you still have the skill set to do it, the body only has so many falls in it. <laughs> yep. And I'm, I'm just about at that fall limit. Um, so I, I just have to just probably say no. I, this was kind of like a last hurrah. I didn't expect to do this. Uh, when Matt Heilman and Dave Raisin called me and asked me if I wanted to be in the team, I was thinking about putting an application. In, so this was kind of like maybe an icing on the cake, you know, my, maybe that I mean to get one more world gold medal in a different discipline. Uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, it's pretty tough to beat that. Yeah, no. Awesome. So with that being said, for Keith St. Ange, what is his future plans in the sport on and off the water? Um, where do you see your role now uh, moving forward? Well, we're we're part of the uh, Cypress Gardens show ski team here in Winterhaven. My my wife, she's been a show skier since she was six years old, so it's in her blood. I love the water still. I love the boat. We go out skiing with our kids all the time, and they're involved in the ski team, so they they're loving that. So that we'll continue doing that for years to come, as long as the kids enjoy doing that. So so I'll always have a role in water skiing. Um, you know, still sponsored by Masterline and Eagle Wetsuits, so I I still want to help promote them and 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 just in, enjoy the sport um uh, like i always have um but now you know i sold the, the world barefoot center i sold that ski school four years ago to uh you know david uh swampy and ben they're the they're the owners and i don't have anything to do with that just because i was getting a little burnt out uh, my career was coming to an end as far as the three event barefooter um and I just, I needed to change things up. I would, with, with, when you got a family and little kids, you know, you can't just go out there and train and be in the boat all the time and running your own business. It take, takes a lot of time. So I was just kind of getting burnt out on everything kind of happened at the, at the same time. So I went to real estate full time. So I'm a real estate agent full time now. Um, and that was because of Bob LaRue. Students used to come down to the ski school, want to buy there. We'd say, hey, go talk to your buddy Bob LaRue in town. He'll find you something. Bob kept on telling Dave and I, get your real estate license, guys. Get, I'm going to retire soon. Go sell direct to your clients. I don't want, don't, don't want to deal with it anymore. So David got his real estate license. I got my real estate license, and uh, that was I was very fortunate that, that it happened that way because now it's giving me the ability to spend more time with my family um, and uh, move on to a different career, challenge myself in a different way. Uh, and it's been it's been awesome. It's been just absolutely awesome. Very cool. Well. This is the 100th anniversary of water skiing, the centennial. And I wanted to ask you, when you think about the history of water skiing, what does the centennial of water skiing mean to you? Oh, man, that's, you know, it's hard to believe it's only been 100 years, right? I mean, okay, 100 years is a long time, but still, um, I mean, I just go back to that first picture of Ralph Samuelson on those big old skis that he made. Uh, that was really cool. You know, you think about, I just think about the history of this sport and where it's, where it's gone and what these people have developed and <clears throat> the time that people put into it, the passion they've all had to do sport on the water um, and just kind of where it's gone and how far it's come. Um, so, yeah, when I think of that 100 year anniversary this year, is just, I just like to think about the history. I'm not really a, 
huge history buff. Like, uh, like if I have to travel to, to Europe, I'm not really a big into that kind of history, but when it comes into the history that I'm passionate about, that I love, I love just thinking back about what these guys did and what they accomplished and the, 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 the paved road that they have given us along the way. So just everything, there's so many things that stick out. I just like thinking about it as a whole. And yeah, uh, you, you, you look holistically back at history and you think about every human being that came before us and that our little dot of a hundred years is on the map. And who would have thought a key St. Ange could do throughout the scope of history, what he could do on his bare feet would just blow the minds of people in antiquity. I mean, it's just how many, how many times did they just walk by water and thinking like, eh, you know, it, and you tell the story uh, at the beginning of your book, when you're on a plane sitting next to a lawyer that looks like he's absolutely miserable in his career <laughs> while you're heading to do some coaching and you strike up a conversation and you say, you know, uh, me and Jesus, we've got something in common. We can walk on water. That's a really, <laughs> really good story. And, I, and I'm going to encourage people to, to go out and grab that book. Uh, like I said, I used my credit on audible.com, pulled it up. It's, it's fascinating to listen to the level of detail that you go into. And I think for toad water sports in general, it's a must read book, especially for those young athletes that are coming up through the ranks to know what to expect and the challenges that lay ahead. But the hope that if you just continue to commit, you get the right support team behind you. Uh, things can come together and you can do some legendary things as you've been able to do. And I cannot wait until that is um, going to memorialize in the, in the induction of the, the hall of fame this next year. With that being said, Keith, I want, this has been a pleasure. It's been amazing getting to speak with you. I feel like I've known you for years after reading your book. I want to give you the opportunity to give people a handoff of where they can find you. Obviously, you're in real estate. So if anyone out there is looking for something um, in the, in the, are you out of Orlando? Um, just uh, Winter Haven. Winter so Haven. Okay. Orlando, but I deal with all of Central Florida. And if I don't go out to the coast, I have realtors that I work with out at the coast. Um, so that's what a lot of people do. A lot of people will actually reach out to me. Since I've traveled around the whole country, they'll reach out to me and say, hey, I'm moving to so-and-so state or this city do you know any realtors there and most times i do because i've kept in touch with all these people that i've traveled with for years so anything real estate related where they need to like if they're going even if they're not coming to my area i can help them if they go to another area so yeah the people can find me on on facebook of course kso properties um sorry we got some kids yelling in the background <laughs> um but yeah of course keith saint Ange on facebook uh ksoproperty.com so yeah, I'm easy to find out there. If you get on Facebook, you will you will find me and my name out there somewhere. So yeah, if you need help with real estate, I'd love to help you out. Well, Keith, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast and congratulations on an incredible year and an incredible career.